This is 40K Today, the 40K podcast so important that we had our psychic awakening ages ago. We've been psychically awake since, like, second edition. Hey, hey, and welcome to 40K Today for your 15-minute daily dose of Warhammer 40,000 news, views, and interviews. It is Friday, September 4th, and I am Paul Murphy. Did you miss me? In this episode, we expand on our men's mental health discussion and run down a 9th edition coaching tip with the wonderful John Lennon. Now is the time where I would normally reveal the results of this week's poll, but Facebook didn't cooperate, so I'm just going to make something up. And staggering 100% of you agreed we should be patient and kind with each other. Don't dream it, be it. If you'd like to participate in next week's poll, please visit our Facebook page. We'll run the poll all week and talk about the results next Friday. Mental health is a challenge here in the U.S. from what I hear all over the globe. We're taking a few moments to continue to shine a light on this subject. Let's hear from a clinical psychologist on the subject. Hello and welcome to the show, Matt. Thank you so much for reaching out to me because uh, you work in the mental health industry. And after our uh, mental health episode for men... Um, you thought you might like to follow up and give us, uh, I'm going to say, a, a clinical professional's opinion or, or perspective. Is that a good way to describe it? Yeah, yeah, that's a, a, a clinical perspective, you know, from a huge nerd who just happens to be a professional. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about uh, your background and then let's talk about some of the things that, that you sort of brought up. I thought they were interesting. Yeah, so I got into Warhammer probably around you know late 6th edition and I got into it competitively probably around 7th uh, aka the dark days of of competitive 40k and all the while I've I uh, have a masters in clinical psychology and I'm a I'm a licensed therapist in my state and I've been seeing patients uh, for mental health and substance use complaints uh, adults teens kids probably for you know the past you know 12 13 years uh, I work in an inpatient hospital right now, so I see a fair bit of that right, uh, you know, at the moment, but also have an outpatient wing to that building. And, you know, we see a lot of the same, you know, the same, you know, themes popping up, you know, left and right between anxiety and depression, especially these days, given, you know, global plague, um, you know, state. And yeah, there's a lot more stressors out in the world, right? So I imagine that is triggering a lot uh, more, like you said, anxiety, stress, depression, yeah, pick your pick your poison. Yeah, as it were. Absolutely, and I'm I'm a big competitive player. I, I go to go to LVO every year. I, I go to I, I go to SoCal. I've, I'm on a I'm on a competitive team. I I have a, like every other 40k player. I have a podcast, The Battle Host. Shameless plug. <laughs> excellent, <laughs> excellent podcast. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, just it's just interesting. I've never listened to a podcast and had it had it you know mold with my profession so succinctly because we don't talk a whole lot about mental health just as a as a country you know as a as a you know as a world you know if, if you ask me and it's just interesting to see it you know intertwined with warhammer which i feel that warhammer has so many positive benefits to mental health let's talk about that like specifically from a clinical perspective what is it about warhammer that can really help um people but what we focused it on men help men cope with some of the this anxiety and depression yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So when individuals come to us, you know, uh, as therapists, as counselors or uh, brain ninjas, some of us call ourselves brain ninjas, uh, to, you know, they're saying, hey, I'm, I'm experiencing some, de- some, you know, some anxiety, I'm experiencing some depression. You know, we, we kind of ask a couple, couple screener questions right off the bat. How are you eating? How are you sleeping? Okay, check, check. But mostly for for depression, it'll start with depression. What are you doing with your free time? And that is, and a lot of the times we hear the, 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 the main culprits of, I don't do anything. I'm in my house, I'm watching TV, watching YouTube, um, playing video games, you know, isolated activities where it's, you know, that, that you're passing the time, but that's kind of it. You're not really, you're not really doing much else. And uh, all those activities are fine in moderation, but when they become kind of an escape, that's where the problems, you know, can, can pop up. Getting some enjoyment out of life, getting, doing something that you really uh, are, you know, good at or getting good at and something that you look forward to is so important in battling depression. And 
I may be biased in this, but I, I feel that Warhammer is probably one of the best ways of managing depression because uh, my podcast partner, Mark, has gotten philosophical with it. He said that when you buy a box of models, you're buying a box of potential. <laughs> Okay, and yep, <laughs> I never really understood that until until now. Because when you have a box of minis, there's so many things you can do with them in this hobby. Because there are some individuals that really live for the for the uh, the the building and the collecting of it. Cool, cool, that's, that's yep. awesome. Some of us love to play with those with those miniatures, whether that be open, competitive, or narrative. And some people get really into that narrative stuff. Oh man! Oh yeah! And the re and others. Pe I people love the lore. Or people get oh, engaged. Yeah. There's a there's a million and one ways to engage with a hobby. I mean, some people get into the painting. Some people get into the books, the Black Library. I mean, mm -hmm. it's such an all encompassing hobby. And I think uh, one of the best parts about it is it's inherent. It can be inherently social. Yeah. So it it can get you just do like even sitting around a table like at a game mm -hmm. store and painting your models with other people there is in a way therapeutic I think. Mm -hmm. absolutely uh, i couldn't agree more because again the, the con there's converting in it that that is a that is a point of enjoyment for a lot of people but you said it perfectly john it gets us social it gets us out and it gets us engaged uh with others it helps us kind of find our tribe because as adults it's let's let's be honest as, as adults it's harder to make friends you know when you're an adult because when you're a teenager and you're a kid you're at school you're at uh you're at you're at extracurricular activities you're around kids all the time it's easy yeah. to make friends as adults it's much harder and one of the best ways of making friends is doing hobbies and hobbies such as warhammer can get you out and about socially connected uh but i mean most importantly i don't want to i don't want to glaze over it too much but when you are engaging in this hobby there's therapeutic meth there's therapeutic modalities that stress when you find a hobby and something you enjoy to do find something that you are practicing a skill and getting good at and getting better at whether that's painting you know or playing or forging that hard narrative as long if your hobby is getting you good at something that uh, studies show that is the best hobby to have to battle depression and anxiety and help build that self esteem oh. at the same time so if you're making progress, you're learning new techniques in painting, for example. Um, and I saw I, I saw something recently that said that uh, you get more dopamine hits from doing something that is difficult for you mm -hmm. and accomplish and accomplishing it than the actual accomplishment. So the process of doing it is where is a really big benefit. So that makes a lot of sense to me. So mm -hmm. if people are growing in their hobby, whether it is getting better at the game or getting better at painting or whatever, mm -hmm. it it's actually battling that depression, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it is, you, you hit it, the nail on the head. It's releasing more of those, more of those positive neurotransmitters, the dopamine, the, the serotonin. Uh, it just is, it's more effective uh, as, as far as, as far as battling depression and being, it's, it'd be more of a preventative factor. What we call it prevents depression from forming or, or taking over type thing. For sure. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. So that's good as a preventative measure. Is it also good as a treatment to like help lift you out of it? How would you describe that? So as a, as a treatment, again, I'm, I'm biased, but like Warhammer provides us a lot. Um, there is, I mean, I believe one of your guests on the first mental health episode talked about how his mind was, his mind was always racing. He could never really, he could never really quiet it down. And I mean, that is anxiety. I mean, those, those are ruminating thoughts, and, and a vast majority of the uh, of the population deals with those sorts of things. Ruminating thoughts about the past, ruminating worries about the future. Um, you know, am I going to fail that test tomorrow? Uh, you know, ruminating worries, ruminating thoughts. Oh my gosh, I tripped on my way inside this building. I must have looked like a total dweeb to everybody. Those sorts of ruminating thoughts that you know can circle around in our mind and just grow completely out of control. Things like painting are a great way of quieting the mind from things like that. Um, a lot of the times in therapy sessions, we tell people to you know do meditation, journal, uh, crossword puzzles, Sudoku. Those are all great distraction methods for for managing those ruminating thoughts. But why not do that via a hobby that you really enjoy by list building on your list building app? That's a great way of managing ruminating thoughts. 
Uh, building is a great way. Uh, talking through lists with your teammates or uh, your, your playing group. You know, these are all wonderful ways of managing ruminating thoughts and, and anxiety. That's great. Well, it's really, really cool to get a perspective of, you know, a professional to kind of talk about what is actually great about our hobby in this regard. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll just say quickly, if any of you out there are struggling and, you know, it's not hard to imagine that you could be struggling in a time like this, like slow down and paint your models, engage with your community, you know, talk with the guys or guys and gals, I should say, I guess. And, uh, you know, get out there. Would you give any, what, what advice would you give if you would say somebody was struggling? You know, I would, I would, you know, encourage that person to, to, um, I guess, find the thing that makes them happy because life is full of a whole lot of unpleasantness, you know, as it were, I mean, you know, modern, you know, current events, work, school, whatever, stressing you out, family life, stressing you out. There has to be time for play. There has to be time for things that you enjoy doing. And if Warhammer is your great, do that. Uh, if it's not, go find the thing that you like to do. And hopefully that thing has a community building. It will help you with competitive cup stacking or underwater basket weaving or whatever you need to do to get women out of life because it, it could well save your life. Very cool. All right. Well, thanks again for reaching out. And uh Hopefully you guys will get a chance. We'll put a link in the show notes to the battle hosts if you want to hear more of uh, Matt and Mark. And uh, I will highly recommend their podcast. It's a good time. All right. Thanks, Matt. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot for that. I know these subjects aren't easy or always fun to talk about, but as we mature as a community, I'm really glad we can take a few moments to discuss things like this. Today's episode of 40K Today is brought to you by Frontline Gaming. Frontline Gaming is a one-stop shop for all your Warhammer hobby needs, discounted products, American-made gaming mats and terrain, and a full line of miniatures painting service and daily hobby content. And this can all be found at FrontlineGaming.org. And we are back. Get your notepad and pencils handy. Scratch that. Make sure you aren't driving and then get your notepads and pencils ready for this next coaching tip. John Times 2, take it away. Welcome back to the show, Mr. John Lennon, the Art of War's very own coach. We're here to give a tip for all those people getting into ninth edition to help them get a little better. What do you got for us today? All right. I am here to talk to you about how to protect your objectives and instances of targeting. What that means is how many instances of shooting or close combat it takes to kill uh, a given unit or area or whatever you know group of units you need on an objective. So one of the most classic examples here is if you need to hold an objective, you're going to put a unit on it, and your opponent probably doesn't want you to hold that objective, so it's pretty likely that they're going to try to shoot you off. You can use dedicated transports and character targeting and similar rules to make sure that it takes different amounts of uh, like shooting to actually carve through that. So let's just give an example. Let's say you have a rhino, five tactical marines, and a captain. If you put the rhino on the objective with the tactical marines inside and then like the captain behind the rhino, it's now going to take three instances of shooting in order to clear that out. So first they would have to shoot the rhino and kill it. Then they have to shoot the tactical squad and kill it. Then they have to shoot the captain. If everything goes according to plan, it's taking a minimum of three units to shoot you off that objective. This can be really valuable against certain armies like uh, Grey Knights or Imperial Knights or just armies that only have a couple of shooting units. So if they've got some big Death Star, like 10 Paladins with all of the buffs, that can still only shoot at one of those three units because they can't target the Captain. So that one instance of shooting can at most only kill the Rhino. So you're 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 stacking different uh, targeting denial, I'll, I'll call it, right? Because you can't target the Tac Marines because they're inside the Rhino. Obviously, the Rhino has to... to uh, you know, it not exist. They have to be kicked out of the rhino before you can shoot them. And what it really does is it just doesn't allow people to split fire efficiently, right? You're basically reducing their efficiency in untying this knot you've tied for them, which is I'm sitting on this objective. I would like to score this objective. So I've put this little nice little knot together and, and it's more difficult to efficiently deal with it because of the layers of uh, target denial. Does that make sense? Exactly. So you really just use that to just to make sure that it's not as easy for your opponent to contest that objective. 
Um, Because if you were to put something like three guardsman units on an objective, again, it's still three units. But let's say that same paladin squad, maybe that paladin squad splits fire and it shoots, you know, three stormbolters at each of the guardsman units. And if they roll well, they might actually be able to kill all of those guardsmen. Like, it's possible. But it's not possible for them to break through three different layers that have to be targeted separately. So that's really good. Um, if you have an MSU army, that's a good way to approach big, tough units. It's not as effective against MSU army, so you, you would have to use different tactics in that case. But even then, if they only have so many units that can threaten a Rhino, that, that is still a very good answer because they won't also be able to use those guns on the tactical marines. I think the other thing that's worth pointing out is um, you, you're, you're, you're instituting uh, points of failure for your opponent, right? Because, sure, they may, have, they may have an MSU army and they might be like, okay, it's going to take this one unit to kill that Rhino. Well, sometimes you roll hot and you roll some sixes on your saves or they roll really low on their wound rolls. Whatever happens dice spike in a direction or another and that rhino lives through something it shouldn't have so now they've got to dedicate another unit to it and pretty soon they're walking down their path and they've already sort of committed to it but they're not able to accomplish their goal because you know because they they had these it, these different failure points and so like you can you can it, uh, with the randomness of dice uh basically give you a leg up in the winning of this the mission Exactly. Uh, as you said, a lot of failure points, a lot of places where that plan could go wrong. Again, if they shoot a pretty good anti-tank unit at a Rhino and they do nine wounds, they have a one wound Rhino. That's one entire unit that now has to shoot to take the last wound off the Rhino. And it won't be able to split fire onto the captain or the tactical Marines because they're not targetable right now. Yeah. And what's really interesting about that example is, sure, you're like, well, maybe they'll just kill it with uh, some bolters quick. But bolters can fail, fail to kill a rhino, <laughs> right? Yeah. And those bolters might have been better off going into the tack marine so that you could get at the captain. Exactly. So, yeah, um, you're just instituting problems for your opponent. And it also, it gives them, you know, like if their plan is to win the game on mission by shooting you off that objective and it fails, you've now gained a big leg up on winning the actual game. Exactly. Uh, using things like that, you can do that on multiple objectives. You know, you can use that while hiding on other objectives. That can be a really good way to make sure that you get good primary points and make it very difficult for your opponent to shoot you off of it. And even then, if they have to put three or four or five units to clear off that objective, may, that's a lot of other stuff that wasn't able to shoot at something like a Predator or an Impulsor or other units in the game. Right. I mean, there's there's this other concept, right, where you those units are not units that kill your opponent's stuff. They don't really do work is how I would describe it. Mm -hmm. You know, your rhino doesn't kill anything. The tack marines inside are very unlikely to kill anything. The captain can kill stuff if he gets into hand-to-hand -hand and he has like, you know, he's a smash captain or whatever. But those units are not doing work on a turn for turn basis. So if your opponent is dedicating resources to killing things that you're not doing work with or just standing on an objective, yeah. sure, they're advancing their game, but they're also getting behind in the attrition race that way. Yeah, that's a big deal. All right, John, I think that's a great concept. Hopefully people will be able to apply it in their games, use those, uh, those layered stackings of uh, you know, shooting denial abilities um, to really kind of uh, make playing the primary a little easier. I think that was a great tip. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me on, John. Always a pleasure. Thanks, gents. I know I feel more prepared for the tabletop. Jingle, jangle, it's time for that model of the day. It's the... The model of the day, the, the model of the day, the, the model of the day. Hiya, Steve here. You know what? I'm going to interrupt Paul and take this one myself. I love this model of the day so much, I just wanted to tell you about it. I had to be here for this. It's a blood letter of corn, and this thing is incredible. From my man's 40k on Insta, the blood letter is standing on a scenic lava base, and it's incredibly well done. That cork turn to rock is stunning and the lava perfectly accents the warm reds and golds on the model itself bright yellow eyes which perfectly draw your attention right back up to that face the smoothness of the orange blending through to red on the skin has to be seen to be believed this thing is dark and deep and rich and evil but at the same time it's bright and highlighted perfectly you really want to see it and that sword don't even get me started have a look at it on insta you can check it out my man's 40k link is in the show notes all right back to paul to wind this thing up and that's a wrap for today a big thank you to our content producer alex bainter and our social media guru tanya gates and our technical producer seamus ronan for the hard work behind the scenes pulling this show together each and every day in the wrap-up coming to you 
on the Frontline Gaming Network and the Forge Narrative YouTube page and everywhere else you're going to find podcasts coming up Saturday. Don't forget to tune in to that best of. For John, Steve, and myself, Paul Murphy, thanks again for tuning in and we will see you next week. That's what's happening in 40K today.